Good morning, everyone. Welcome back, or welcome for the first time if you haven't been here before. If uh, if you are new, uh, make sure that you join the chat and uh, look where everybody's from and mention where you're from too. I teach uh, watercolor all the time. One of the issues that I'm seeing when I'm teaching is people are having trouble with getting rich color or they're having trouble with getting um, shadows dark enough and all of that sort of thing. Reds in particular are especially tricky because they end up um, very often looking uh, kind of washed out. They, they never dry as brilliant as what they look like when they're wet. So there's a couple of little tips I'm going to give you today that are going to maybe help you with your reds and um, get a little bit more dimension in your, especially red flowers um, or, or pretty much anything that's a bright red. So uh, if you're not familiar, I am Shelley Pryor. I'm a watercolor artist in Ontario, Canada. And every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, that's uh, near Toronto, I do a free watercolor demonstration. So thanks for joining. And uh, as usual, I see everybody's from all over the place. Uh, I'm reading some of the comments. That's awesome. Uh, where everybody's from. We've got Pennsylvania. We've got um, uh, Indiana. We've got uh, Massachusetts. We've got uh, Oakville, Canada, uh, Winnipeg, Netherlands, Ohio, South Dakota, UK, um, Oklahoma, all, all the time. You need richer darks? Awesome. So let's have a let's have a look at uh, some of the materials I'm going to use for this demo today. We'll try not to make this a really long one, I'll, but we'll see. I always say that and then, <laughs> and then it goes a little long, but hang around and uh, we'll spend a little time painting together. So let me just switch on over here to my uh, work surface. Okay, so, so this is my uh, paper. I have stretched 140 pound arches one um, or cold press paper onto um, this is a very sturdy board but I've stapled it down I, I soaked it three minutes wet room temperature and then I stapled it down wet and uh, let that dry overnight and then I taped off the edges so I have pre-stretched my paper and um, I'm going to be using mostly da Vinci watercolors uh, but I'm going to be using uh, more transparent colors. I'm not. Re I know when you see red, your automatic response is to grab a, a tube of cadmium red, but there's that's a good thing and a bad thing. And so I'll explain that in a minute. I'm going to be using a variety of brushes. I'll be using um, some squirrel hair brushes. I'll be using some um, synthetic brushes. And uh, most of the materials that I use, you can find on the materials page of my website. My website's right there. And uh, so I list all of that stuff and where I get it and all of that sort of thing. So rather than spending time today answering all of that, you can look that up. All right. And uh, so in order to do my red um, tulip here, you can see that when I print it out on my copy paper, it's really not near as brilliant as what's here. Now, I expect that my painting's probably going to come out a little bit more like this because don't forget, when you're looking at something on, on the screen and it's a bright, bright color, it's, back limit, it's backlit, right? You're seeing it illuminated from behind. That doesn't mean that we can't come close, but uh, we probably can't get it quite as bright as that. But we'll do our best and so I'm going to be starting off with maybe something surprising but I am going to paint my red tulip yellow. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take a large brush here, just a big large round brush. Uh, this one's a squirrel hair brush. It holds lots. It, it, something with a big belly is good to use and um, I'm going to zoom in maybe a little bit more just so you can see a little bit. My camera's going funny there. There we go. And I'm going to paint this a nice warm yellow. So for my yellow, I'm going to be using, this is Da Vinci. It's a uh, gamboge is the color. It's a nice warm yellow. And 
I'm going to not put it on really thick, but uh, I want to make sure that there's, I've warmed up the paper. I'm using bright white paper, which surprisingly is actually on the cool side. Most whites are. So if I'm putting a nice warm color down, I'm going to warm up the color of the paper first. Uh, and if you have a question, um, can you put it in capitals? It's a lot easier for me to find when I'm skimming through to see if there's any questions. And uh, how do I know if watercolor paint is transparent? Ah, very good question. Um, I have, if you take a black line, such as this, one of these big, this is a jumbo marker. Now this is waterproof, so that's important that it be waterproof because I'm going to do this line on here. And if I paint over this, um, I will be able to tell whether or not my color is transparent or not. So if I were to take let me put my yellow on first, and then that'll give this um, ink enough time to dry. And I'll come back and I'll, uh, I'll explain the difference between opaque and transparent. So this is a nice um, bright warm yellow that I'm adding on here, and I'm just adding it to my entire tulip. Which seems like a crazy thing to do, but it will um, it will make more sense the more I as I get closer to painting the reds on here. <clears throat> I'm working on dry, but I'm working very quickly, which means I'm filling up my brush. It's really loaded up. Um, cadmium red, by the way, is an opaque color cadmium anything is an opaque color. So if you get cad orange or cad yellow or cad red, um, those are all opaque colors. So if you see the word cadmium, it's opaque. You may find uh, hues which are substitutes for the original. Cad cadmiums are not um, um, well, let's say let's put it this way. They're slightly toxic, okay? Well, they're quite toxic. So I don't use any cadmiums in my paintings. Um, not that it's it's great for the paintings, and sometimes cadmiums are wonderful. They're so rich in color, and they give you amazing uh, rich color. But um, in when I'm painting my watercolors, I love to see the white paper shining through. I like to see the uh, um, I like to see the, the brightness of that white paper coming through the color. All right, so there's my yellow, <laughs> red tulip yellow. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to take a color here, a red color, and I'm going to paint, well, let's just, I'm going to do a yellow first here. Let's do a yellow. I'm going to do some yellow right here. That's the yellow I've used on my paper. and I'm just going to put some of that there. Now I'm going to come over here to this. Uh, this color is called Rose Door. Rose Door is very similar to like a Scarlet Lake or something like that. It's kind of an orange red. Uh, there's pink reds and then there's orange reds. So this is kind of an orange red. And if I paint this over that black line, Let's put it on pretty, pretty strong here. And you might think, well, wow, that's kind of covering. It must be opaque, but wait till it dries. Then I'm going to grab, I have to grab my um, color over here. Well, maybe I have it right here. That'll be faster here. One second. Just going to grab my other palette, which has my cad red in it. Okay, so I've labeled. Make sure you label all your all your uh, 
colors here. And I'm going to go with um, this Cad Red Light. Now it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit uh, dry. <laughs> well, it's very dry because I don't use it very often. And I didn't pre-soak it the way I pre-soaked all my colors over here. So pre-soaking your colors will start to soften them up. It'll be a lot easier to get rich color if you have softened up paint. So I have to work at this, which is kind of rough on your brushes to keep working on this, but I need to get a color that's just about as strong as what I've put down. There we go, and I'm going to paint this over the line. get a little more. It's really hard to get this softened up when it's been hard for so long. So those two colors right now don't look too different, right? They're very, very similar. You'd almost swear they were the same color, but I have to try to get each color on here, you know, as like equally. So I don't want to have one that's thin and one that's, let's face it, if you Thin, thin down anything, you can make it transparent, but then the color is weak. So I'm trying to get rich color, but transparent. So I'm going to let those two dry. When you can already see um, that this first one is starting to dry and that black line shows really, really well. So that's a transparent color. Now uh, the cadmium red, this is Cad Red Light by, this is a Da Vinci as well. So there's, it's the same brand. This is Cad Red Light. Very, very similar in color, but it uh, it's covering up that black line a little bit more. Now we'll revisit this and um, we'll take a look at what that looks like. This color that I used first, the transparent one, is called Rose Door. D apostrophe O-R. Or Rose Doré. Uh, it, you know, whichever way you want to pronounce that. But I'm going to take some of this color, this rose door, that the first color I used, and I'm going to paint it over my yellow. Some of it on my yellow and some of it on my white paper. And we're going to watch how that dries. It kind of looks the same right now. But we'll wait and see how that dries because I think you'll notice a difference between what I have painted on the cold, cool white paper versus what I've painted on that nice yellow, which is why I have warmed up my paper. So let's, uh, let's see if I can speed this up a bit. Use my uh, trusty dryer here. And I'll dry both my painting and this swatch. And we'll see how they look. Now I put quite a bit of color on there. It was pretty wet. Oh, are we getting some spam here? Let me check. Um, oh yes, let's uh, let's get rid of you. <laughs> uh, remove. Let's see. If I can get rid of this person. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to remove this person. Uh, 
uh, I will ask that you there we go now, if, now you're you're hidden and reported there you go <laughs> so sorry about that um, Yeah, no, no religion, no, um, no politics, no <laughs> spam, all of that sort of thing. There we go. So uh, you can see that this is now starting to, um, now that this is dry, you can see that the black line looks very different on this transparent color than it does on the opaque color. And... Uh, I'm not sure if this really shows uh, too well here, but yeah, on camera it's not really showing that well, but here where we have the yellow underneath, that red is is sort of vibrating a little bit. It's It's got a lot more color. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to now start glazing on, like putting more layers on top of my, um, on my um, yellow. And when I do that, I will have a more lively yellow. Now here's the thing. Is the, is the red in the, in the sun the same as the red that's in the shadow? I would say no. This one's almost um, leaning towards a, a purple red, like a, more of a, a rosy red. So there's also a couple of highlights here. Now these highlights aren't bright and shiny like you know a piece of glass or anything like that, but they are shiny and I'm going to lift out some highlights there. So. Um, let me just check here to, yeah, I, I got rid of them. <laughs> I got rid of them, Michael. Thanks. Um, yes, I, I did block him. Sorry about that. Yeah, there's always one, right? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to paint in this nice orange red on top of my, uh, on top of my yellow. That's going to make that red a little more alive. So I'm only painting the fold over part of this because the fold over is actually a completely different red. And this is a mistake that I used to make all the time when I was painting is that I, I made red and then I made darker red and I just it was the same red but it was just darker and I wasn't thinking about how warm uh, something would be in the sun, how how warm it, uh, the color would be in the sun, and how cool the color would be in the shadows. So that's what I want to pay attention to here, is I really want to get a little bit more of that type of thing. So for my warm, I'm going to be using this nice rose door, that nice orangey red. For my shadows, I'm going to be using something more like an alizarin crimson. This one's an, a permanent alizarin crimson. Um, yes, true, true. Jan's art says, uh, um, I paint a lot of cardinals and paint a yellow undercoat. Makes the red so much more vibrant. Yes. And uh, so for my shadows, I'm going to be using this permanent alizarin crimson, which is definitely more, you can see them side by side. This one looks orange. This one looks more like a cherry kind of red. And... Um, while this is wet, I'm going to use just a little bit of this. Now let's have some paper towel handy. Always have a paper towel in my hand. Don't want to put too much on, so I'm blotting just the belly part. <clears throat> and at the edges, I'm just going to put a little bit of this different red along the edges because that's what's going to make that uh, look like it's got a curve to it. It's, it's fading away now into some shadow. So that gives that some curve to it. If you just paint it one value, one color, it will look very flat. So now what about that highlight? I'm going to blot my brush 
and lift. Now my brush is really blotted well. It's almost dry. As dry as I can make it with my paper towel anyway. And I'm going to pull some of this color out of here. Right, so I did all of that while that was wet. I'm going to do that in a couple of other places. So I'll move along pretty quickly here and just do one at a time. Each of these little fold overs, so the light is getting to those much more than it is getting to uh, the inside red. This would be like the outside red. <coughs> Pardon me. All right, so that's that rose door. <coughs> Pardon me. Drink. And I'm going to go to my um, alizarin crimson again. <coughs> I think there was coffee grounds in there. <laughs> and I'm going to go along the edge of the this red with uh, with this other red and that's going to make that look like it's curling over so I'm creating the form as I go along and and I'm just going to continue with each portion like this and it's one thing that's important here is when you come in to add the alizarin crimson or you're starting to add into a color that's wet on your paper, here's the important part. They should be the same consistency, not wetter. If it's wetter than the first color on the paper, then you will create a blossom. And one thing that's really going to help you with um, controlling that is to make sure that you're placing the color on the paper um, and letting it sort of sit on top as opposed to um, adding some to the surface and then spreading it out thin because that's just going to soak right into the paper. But if I'm using, um, you know, lots of paint, hopefully you can see that there's maybe a bit of a puddle there as I'm putting this on. Whoops. I'll zoom in here, maybe you can see it a little better. But you can see that I'm kind of putting a lot of color on there and it's nice and wet. That's going to stay wet longer than if I put it on and spread it out. Like see I'm spreading it out now and I'm spreading it all over the place. That's going to dry much faster than me putting color on and just letting it sit on the surface. So, well, you can do that by uh, just using the tip of your brush and hardly any pressure. You don't need any pressure on your brush with watercolor. I can't even think of too many instances where, you know, you really need to press and spread it out. Uh, most, of the, most of the painting in watercolor is done wet on wet or wet on dry but in any case it's wet so don't spread it out and, and dry it by spreading it out. So more of this alizarin crimson. It can be drier than what's on here but can't be wetter. So I'm going to come in along the sides and drop in. You can see that that's flowing very nicely because that first color is quite um, quite wet. If that first color were dry and I was putting color like this in here, it would definitely create blossoms. So I'm putting this nice cool red on top of the warm red to create form. There we go. So I've got two reds in there now. What about highlight? Rinse my brush. Brush is clean, blotted, and I'm going to pull out a little bit of color here. It's fresh color. It should come off pretty easy. Let's wipe that off. 
a synthetic brush is actually easier than um, the these brushes kind of bend because they're very soft bristle and I can use a synthetic brush this one's not very small here's a smaller one okay just a damp synthetic brush is good for lifting out that kind of thing bristles are a little bit springier they spring back a little bit more and I can pull out that highlight. Now I have to make sure that my brush isn't too wet though because if my brush is really wet once again I'm gonna make a blossom that's why I'm blotting this brush so well. Okay so one one at a time I'm creating this this form and let's come into this next one. Hmm. Let's do all the little foldovers first. I'm going to come over here to the other side. Zoom back out again now that you saw that close. And nice runny paint that I'm working with. So I like these um, scroll hair brushes for that because they hold a lot and the paint will sit on the surface a little longer before it soaks in. That gives me enough time to, to work. Just checking to make sure I don't have any questions. Remember, if you're just joining and you, um, you have a question for me, it's a lot easier for me to find the questions if you put them in capitals. nice wet paint it's kind of sitting on the surface and the reason I'm telling you this this sitting on the surface thing is because so often um, you know the paint loses its shine and then people are trying to come in with more color and not understanding that the um, the surface is now too dry to be adding more color to so let's show you how shiny this is see how wet that is nice and shiny and now I'm switching over to my permanent rose, or sorry, my um, alizarin crimson. Oops. And I pre uh, pre wet all of my uh, wells on my palette so that they have nice uh, creamy paint that I'm working with. I'm not trying to work work my brush into a dried well. Let's slide this along here. Right around this outer edge, it's a little bit curved, so I want to get that that look there. And I don't want to play with it too much. Just let it do its thing. And there's not much highlight on there, so I'm just going to not put a highlight on that one any lifting but let's try uh, I'm gonna I'm going to do this one now this one's going to transition into a very dark um, uh, this one's going to transition from the warm to the uh, cool in one petal how do I get it uh, to be much larger than the print would be well, I print it out and I put graphite paper underneath and I trace it. So I just printed this on 8.5 by 11 paper. Um, I didn't take the time to draw it. I was kind of hurrying today, so I didn't get it all drawn out by hand. But uh, yeah, that's what you can do. Just print it on your on your paper. Uh, you do have to choose the, that on your the settings of your... Um, printer though. I need to dry something. This is this is going to run into that. I have to be careful here. Let's, I'm going to spread this out so that it doesn't make a hard edge. And 
and I'm going to dry this before I try and put the rest of this petal on because this petal next to that wet one that'll cause problems for sure. <laughs> they all have I'll have blossoms like crazy. Why don't I do a basic red as a second layer and then the shadow red as highlights? Because then I'm putting the, the cool over the warm and I really want to keep them more separate than that. Um, in some places I only want the cool, so... And in a sense, I'm, I am kind of doing, as you're saying, uh, you know, I'm doing one section and controlling it that way, but uh, if I did it all over everything, I'd have a very good chance of losing my line drawing too. <laughs> what time of texture does 140 pound paper have compared to 300 pound? The, uh, actually, the, you can get it in various textures, and the textures are called the same. Uh, it's either hot press, cold press, uh, rough, or um, the newer one is smooth, and uh, this the textures are similar. It's the absorbency of the paper that's that makes the big difference between the poundage of the paper. The poundage is how how thick the paper is, the weight. All right. So now that that's dry and cooling off, still a little warm. I'm going to jump over to this one. And I'm going to paint in this nice bright red here. This nice warm red. You can see the, how the paint flows really easily when it's really wet like this. It flows quite nicely. There's quite a bit of this warm red down in here too. Now, because this is a bigger petal, I want to show the difference between those two reds even more. So, um, instead of putting this underneath all of the cool color, the cool red, I'm going to put, put them side by side and let them blend. So, now I'm into my War, or my cool red, so my alizarin, permanent alizarin crimson. Same consistency, right? Equally wet. And I'm going to come into this section here. You know when you go into something that's really wet and you um, lift your brush and then it leaves that kind of pom-pom thing. Work the other way. So if I came, for example, if I came and I lifted my brush here, you can see that it's making that little ball, that little um, expand, expanding bloom of color here. So I'll go the other way. I'll go into the area where it's solid instead of pulling out and lifting my brush. And that seems to um, take care of that. I'm going carefully around my other petal because I know that that other petal is going to need to be a uh, nice warm and I, I need those to be separate. So and I can touch in a little bit more of that cool in or er, yeah, the cool red down into these areas here. I'm 
Here we go. And it works as long as they're the same consistency. If they're different consistencies, you are going to struggle with that more. All right, got kind of a puddle here, so let's just I'm going to touch that with a damp brush just to to take care of that. It's really wet, so um, I just touch that in, and so that it's got an equal shine. You see how everything's got the same shine now, and. I need to lift out those highlights. So back to my synthetic brush and I'm going to pull out a nice highlight here. If I wanted those highlights cooler, which maybe I do, I could have lifted those out from my yellow layer underneath um, in the first stages, but I didn't. So these are going to be lighter but a little bit on the warm side. They'll still look fine but um, midday which is when I took this you get cooler light usually. All right. You can see that when you try to lift something out and the paper's really wet that just kind of fills back in again so you you may have to go the, over this a couple of times to get that to stop filling in on you. there. Okay, so I've got some highlight on there now and fairly satisfied with that. And the important thing is don't go back and fuss with it. How would I deal with blossoming? Can it be corrected? Absolutely it can be corrected, especially if you're dealing with it while it's wet. So let me show you on my other paper here. Well, I'll, sh I'll show you on my painting because I'll sh I've said that and I said it could be corrected. So let's uh, let's deal with that. So if I come in on this petal, which is now dry enough, I can work on it. Nice runny color. Fill up my brush. <clears throat> it's a large area, so uh, I'm going to fill up my brush. <clears throat> not spreading it out too much but but actually I will I'll spread this out because I know that that will dry faster so there we go this area here you'll see it doesn't have as much shine you see that that's what spreading out your paint is going to do for you if you spread it out it will dry much faster and you'll have less time for working all right so if I'm drying that make a hard edge. I'll get hard edges, I'll get blossoms, I'll get nasty stuff. So if you, you know, if you're somebody who's worked in maybe acrylics or something like that, <laughs> this might be really hard for you to do. You can already see, oh, if I can get the shine there, you can see what's wet and what's not. This is really wet up in here. Let's get that rolling back. And look here, I've got, I've got something going on here. Now I'll come in with these uh, with this color, and this will be much wetter. Okay, so this is this is much wetter, and it's going to push back, and it's going to make this this blossom happen because this paint's wetter than what's on there, and you can already see it happening here. Right, I'm coming in. It's 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 out of control, <laughs> so. I need to come in and rein this back in. Okay, so I've got one area that's very wet, one area that's very dry, and it's making blossoms and nasty stuff. And yeah, that's that's a very common issue, especially if you're newer to watercolor. So what do you do? Oh my gosh, that's making such a terrible mess. What do you, what, what do you do? Well, you can leave it dry and then it's a bigger problem. Or you can deal with it while it's wet. So always be aware of what's happening on your paper. Don't don't put the color on and say, okay, I'm going to grab a coffee now. And, and then you run away and uh, you come back and you go, oh, what happened? It always continues to change as it dries. <laughs> you got to remember that. So what do I do? I make it all equally wet. 
right? So you can see, let me show you the shine. You can see what's wet, and, and this looks like it's completely dry. So I'm going to take a little more of this color that's wet, and I'm going to go back over this. Now they're equal. Problem solved. It's the easier solution than you think, right? You think it's going to be so hard, but if you're if you're looking at that shine, now look, everything's the same. Problem solved. That's that's the big secret. It's it's not as disastrous as you might fear. Um, if it's already dark enough, you could just thin your color more and don't put as much extra color on there. So that's how you would correct a blossom. Um, much harder to deal with once it has dried, but not impossible. Uh, if I had a dried uh, blossom, usually the solution is to re-wet the area redistribute those buildups because you know that's what a blossom is it's a buildup of of extra pigment where the wet color has sort of pushed to the edges and then that by re-wetting it and redistributing that excess color you can often make a blossom look a lot better if not correct it completely so um just always be aware you know, if you're conscious of what is happening on your paper surface and how wet your brush is as well, uh, you can solve a lot of problems. Most of it is just not being aware of what's going on in your brush or what's happening on the wet of the paper. And it's it's just a lack of understanding. You you really maybe haven't thought of it. Like you're painting and you're you're looking and you're putting red down, but you're not really thinking, how wet's my brush right now? How wet's my paper right now? Those are very important things to be thinking about as a watercolor artist. Right, so I'm lifting this out now and getting a little bit of highlight on there. There we go. We've got this nice transition so that that petal looks nice and rounded. I think I need a little bit more of the alizarin crimson right over here. Got kind of this curvy shape here. And as long as my brush isn't wetter than what's on the paper, I can put a line right, I can, look, I can totally keep those separate if I want to. Separate but soft. So I have more control if I'm thinking about how wet or dry my brush is. I know this is really wet. See how wet that is? See how shiny it is? You know it's wet. But if my brush is pretty dry, let, let me just show you on my paper doll. See how dry that is? And I come in and I put, took too much off <laughs> showing you how dry it was. But I know that what I've got in my brush right now is pretty dry. And I can come in and, and I can actually put some shape in here. You have more control than you know. You just need to be aware. Now, I think I want to soften this a little bit, so I'll just give it a feather tickle, <laughs> if you will. Just barely, barely, barely touching the paper just to help sort of disperse that a little bit, and I'm happy with that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on to another one. I, I can't work on this one because this one's wet. I'm afraid to work on that one because I'll put my hand in this for sure. <laughs> Guess how I know that. Um, just checking up on the on the questions. Yeah, if you're if you're joining late and you have a question, uh, put it in capitals. It's easier for me to find. So 
So I want to dry this so I don't put my hand in wet color here. I have uh, pre-wet my paper, or pre-painted my paper, I should say, not wet it, uh, but I, I put a layer of yellow underneath. I'm going to leave this one, the interior of that one, for last because that's where we have that beautiful center of the flower, which is, of course, one of the most appealing parts of this painting and definitely the focal point. And I'm going to come in now. don't want my paper hot when I paint on it. But I'm going to start with my um, permanent alizarin crimson here. And if I water this down too much, look at there's hardly any difference. So I need heavier paint. I talked a bit at the beginning about keeping the, the white of the paper showing through. If, if you leave too much of the white paper showing through in your shadows, they won't look dark. <laughs> so you need creamier color, uh, a heavier consistency of paint, uh, paint to water ratio. You need You do need it runny, but you need it... Um, lots of paint in in the puddle. So I'm being very careful to make sure I get some good rich um, rich red in here. And once again, I'm, I'm kind of really puddling up what's on the surface here. No no hard edges. So whenever you're filling something in and you're struggling, and you're getting brush marks, um, I'll bet it's because you're not getting enough paint sitting on the surface. That'd be my 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 guess. But what's going on on with you? So I've got a warm red, I've got a cool red. And putting them in the right places does make a big difference. Now, I may need to make some sort of separation there, but I'm going to see if I can get this uh, kind of a, a little bit stronger color down in here. I'm just going to add more pigment to that wet space there. And here, I want, don't want a hard line starting there, so I need to keep joining where this is wet here. I wanted to get into that. Um, I wanted to get into that little tiny narrow area there. By the way, if you're looking for this reference picture, um, it's my own reference picture, and it's honestly not that in focus. But it really doesn't matter uh, since we're painting it. We can make it in focus. But uh, uh, it is on my uh, Facebook page. I put it under my post on my Facebook page so that you can um, pinch it from there if you want to. And my Facebook page is Shelley Pryor Fine Art. Um, can I use neutral tint for shadow red? Um, I, I probably could, but I, I find that it could dull it a little bit. So I'm trying to use um, the pigments that are already uh, nice and rich while I can. And then if I need to come in with something darker, I, I, may, I may just do that. So I'm coming into my um, warm red, and I'm overlapping these two. I'm also not going as thick as I did. Uh, like, it's not as much pigment in my puddle. Both are wet, but there's more pigment in the cool red to make it darker less pigment in the warm red puddle so that I can see through it more. All right, so I've got this nice sort of transition. It's a little harsh, right? So I'm gonna help it. I'm gonna use this nice soft brush here and I'm just going to 
move some of the dark into the light gently with uh, a nice light touch. Not press it, I'm not pressing my brush down. I'm not spreading any color. I'm just tickling. A lot of watercolor is it's like painting with a feather. Don't press on your paper too much. It's, it's hard on your paper. It's harder on your brushes. And it doesn't give you the result you want. So <laughs> probably not much use to, to pressing hard in watercolor. Uh, what you might find, though, is that uh, as, as you get your paper, you know, especially a large area, it starts to get really wet, then you'll, you'll find that the paper will buckle some. You know, even if you've stretched it, it will buckle and it will, it will have high spots and low spots. And guess where the water gathers? It gathers in those low spots. So it can be very beneficial to tip and tilt your paper to direct color but sometimes that's not even enough so what you can do is use your brush blotted and touch an area so let's say I've got too much here I don't but I mean if I did have a puddle I could touch this and it's nice and wet so I can absorb and wipe off some of the excess do it while it's wet keep an eye on it uh, be aware of what's in your brushes, be aware of your surface, and keep an eye on it. Don't walk away. Uh, watercolor does change as you are painting. So <clears throat> you'll notice though that almost all of these petals have a transition of one kind or another. It goes from warm to cool, warm to cool, warm to cool and so on. Every one of these in order to create the form. Otherwise you don't have um, any shape. It's just going to look like a fat, flat cutout piece. Now the, this first one I did, it's looking a little bit weak. Like it looks a little bit flat. It's dried. It, I probably was easing into it. My paint wasn't as gooey or whatever. So my color's not quite as rich. I may come in and redo this one, but otherwise I think I'm doing okay. So I'm going to come down to this one, do the same sort of thing. You can see that this one is, is nice and light and warm along the top, and then it gets into this cool red down in here. So good rich puddle, but fairly, fairly runny. I want it runny because I need to um, get one color to flow into another one, so I need runny color. And I need to fill up my brush. You see I'm really laying the bit, the belly of the brush down into that puddle and picking up lots. Let me just bring this over to the main screen for a second just so you can see this. So I'm laying down and filling up the whole puddle. Well, my camera doesn't like that white paper, does it? <laughs> it's really struggling. <clears throat> so... Now these, these two have to be dry when you do this, of course. Otherwise they run into each other. And sometimes when you're matching two areas, you end up overlapping a little bit. It's not going to be really noticeable in this particular project, but sometimes you get this overlap when you're trying to join two sections. And, and then you get this extra dark line and you know your tendency is to try to want to fix it right away but honestly it's much easier to do after it's dry and I'll explain that in a minute maybe I can demonstrate all right not too much of this red over here it's mostly in this area right there but it's good and wet nice nice puddled up red on my surface now I'm going to come in with some uh, permanent alizarin crimson, which is equally fluid, but not wetter. And I will come in with my deeper red down here. If I put this... Um, 
warm red under everything. This cool red that I'm putting down uh, will not be as significant. It, it won't be as different. You won't notice it as much. So that's why I'm not um, painting everything the bright red first. Trying to get the shape nice, get up on the tiptoe of my brush when I'm getting, I'm trying to get a nice edge there. But I think I need more color, especially at this lower edge. In some places I need more color, so I'm dropping in more color where I feel like I want to show that there's more form there, uh, more shadows, that sort of thing. And if I have my brush not as wet, you know, just like I showed here, you can actually direct and place extra dark colors very deliberately. So in there, for example, I wanted to show a little extra color. And it's still wet. It's still got shine, right? So I can still get some control when there's shine on the paper. I just have to make sure my brush is drier. And again, it's be aware of what's in your brush. And there's this kind of a V that comes up here. I want to get that in there. <clears throat> make sure my brush isn't too wet. Now, I, I think that's probably going to be dark enough. I don't know if I want to be adding in something like a neutral tint because that's really going to dull my, my cool red. And I'm trying, of, trying to keep my colors vibrant, so that might, uh, that might not give me what I'm looking for. One thing about reds, uh, reds in particular, seem to always dry a lot more flat <laughs> than than other colors do. I guess because it's so so uh, rich to begin with. You know, we think of red as being so brilliant, but um, it dries and then it doesn't have that gloss on it anymore. So it always looks not as it looks flatter looking. So trying to compensate for some of that by, you know, exaggerating some of these things, which when dry won't be as noticeable. Now there's a little lifting I need to do out of this one. So let's grab my synthetic brush and blot it on my paper towel. And I'm going to lift out a little highlight right here and here. Pull that color out and wipe it on my paper towel. And as I said, you know, if you wanted uh, your highlights to be more cool looking, uh, then, you know, you would lift out that yellow from the first stages. Sigma, sig, single pigment colors better for vibrancy. Sometimes. Um, my uh, Gamboge and my Areolan are both mixtures. And I find that they are actually brighter than the the natural uh, gamboge and areolan. So that's why I say sometimes. Sometimes they are. They're definitely better for um, mixing with other colors because 
it's more predictable. You have, you know exactly what's in it. If it's a single pigment, you mix one pigment with another pigment, you get, you know, that. If you have three colors in there, it starts to get a little bit dicey. So for mixing colors, yes, uh, single pigment colors are very good, uh, but it's not necessarily more vibrant. Not necessarily. Sometimes, sometimes it is, but it's not a rule. Oh, oh suggested for blooms? Oh, well, I guess you can watch the replay, but um, basically it's taking care of it while it's wet and any any areas that are starting to dry, get them wet again. That's the, that's the short version of what I did to correct my blossoms. All right, so that's coming along. Let's give this a dry and I'm, I want to finish this petal. I still have a fair bit of shine on this, so I, I want to make sure that this is dry before I work on this one, this one here next to it. So you can see how much more that's died down since I dried it. Um, when I was using the alizarin crimson, permanent alizarin crimson, yes, that's all I used. I didn't mix it with anything. I put the colors more or less side by side, over overlapping them a little bit, I guess. But uh, but yeah, mostly just uh, pure alizarin, permanent alizarin crimson. Now, I didn't use any neutral tint or anything like that in there. I just used more pigment. And that keeps it from being more dull. So if I were to take my alizarin crimson, like this on my scrap piece, this is my alizarin crimson. And I can make it darker by putting more pigment down like this or I could also make it darker by adding a neutral tint now that was one of the suggestions and a lot of I get that a lot actually people ask about neutral tint and I love neutral tint by the way but I don't find it's you know useful for everything so I'm going to use neutral tint here let's um I'll mix it on my palette here I'll mix it with my permanent alizarin crimson and you'll see that what I end up with is is definitely a duller dark red. Um, even if I put even more um, in there, it's 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 duller. It's going to dry less uh, vibrant. So I'm using more pigment here in order to get that a little bit darker. That's my my first choice. If I really need something extra dark, yes, I can do that. Other warm reds as vibrant as Rose Door, like Vermilion or Scarlet, um, or Permanent Rose. Okay, um, the, yeah, check your manufacturer, uh, the brand that you have. I basically have um, swatches where I have painted all of my colors so that I can compare them and see which ones are more vibrant than others, rather than guessing. One thing that you'll notice when you look at a palette like, look at all these colors here. You can't really tell what they look like because they all look dark. <laughs> They're all really dark. These reds look very, very similar. Uh, well, maybe not this one. This is the this is the, the rose door. Sorry, my camera really doesn't like <laughs> white papers. I'll put that there to stop flashing. Um, but you know it's really hard to distinguish when you're looking at paint in a well so take it test it see what you like best um, what is oh 
The difference between alizarin crimson and permanent alizarin crimson means that the color is more permanent, um, less fugitive. That is one of the problems with um, um, alizarin crimson is that it is uh, notoriously famous for being fugitive and not uh, retaining its original color. So they developed permanent alizarin crimson so that the color wouldn't um, wouldn't fade over time or change color. So that's the difference. When you see the word permanent in front of something, you, you can pretty much assume that that is something that is uh, designed for permanency, like permanent rows as well. Uh, doesn't, yeah, we can get into whole color thing afterwards, but, <laughs> or on another day, I suppose. But, uh, but yeah, that's basically what the permanent, permanent means in permanent Elizabeth. Alizarin crimson, pyrrole red. Pyrrole red, uh, yeah, ch check your manufacturer. One of the things about color is you can, um, you can look for symbols. This symbol is, this square is transparent. This is uh, semi-transparent. This symbol is semi-opaque, and this symbol is opaque. So you can look for that. If it's not on the tube, check the website. Um, you can check it even when you're at the store. There's usually those symbols um, available. You might also see transparent, semi-transparent. You might just see initials here, uh, semi-opaque or opaque. Right? You might just see those initials. So check for those as well. Could you not add a transparent blue or purple to the crimson to get a darker red? You could, but it might start to lean over a little bit too more, too much towards a purple. Um, uh, I, I like my permanent alizarin crimson. I find it makes a nice warm, warm red by itself. But there's always there's always another way of working around things with what you have. You don't you know when you take a class, you don't have to buy everything that the instructor tells you unless they're very very finicky about that sort of thing. But most of the time you have something that you can use. Um, my my advice is just experiment and see what you have and what you can mix together and take time and play with your colors, see what they do. All right, this is cooled down enough now. I'm going to come in with my last uh, petal here uh, before I do this one. And I'm going to start off with my rose door over here. My rose door is going to be right next to my permanent rose, or, or sorry, my alizarin crimson. Right, it's nice and light along there. Now I'm coming in with my permanent alizarin crimson and the two can meet over here so I've got I've got the warm here and now I've got the permanent alizarin crimson next to that and then these two will meet and make a really nice transition I'm going to put a little bit more of the warm red, the rose door, up in here. So that's why I left that blank. But nice and wet color uh, will blend beautifully, especially in a big area. Now this is, this is one of the reasons why some people will tell you that painting large is easier. If you use nice wet color, you don't have to work at all to blend the colors. But it's problematic when you're working really small because you've got too small an area. And if you're coming in with really, really wet color, well, of course, the two's just going to mix together and fill in that little, little, little area. So you, you want to make sure that you're working large enough that you can get these transitions to work. Right. 
and I can tickle that together and just get a really nice blend there. Just, just the way I like it. Both colors are wet. I can sort of tickle them together like that and get just what I'm looking for. Always thinking, how wet's my brush? I don't want to come in, rinse out my brush and all of a sudden get a, a really dark color or something, a really wet color. Okay, so that's to my liking now. And, and I'm going to come, oh, I have one over here I have to do too. This one, I don't really see any light. I don't really see any light showing in there. So this one I'm just going to fill in with permanent alizarin crimson. And we're almost at the best part, the middle of the flower. But these bigger areas, of, especially when you're working wet, you want to get those out of the way because those wet areas need to be done before any detail. I know detail's fun and you want to get to it and all of that stuff, but you do need to get these washes and the wet areas out of the way because I'm working so wet. Can you imagine if I put this over top of detail? There goes my detail, right? So got to do all this wet stuff first. I like getting rid of the white paper too. You know, when you don't see just plain paper coming through. All right, let's. If I want to get that a little darker, I come on top of what I've done, drop a little more color in. There we go. So I can make that extra dark there. I don't know that it needed to be quite that dark, but uh, just to show it. might put a little bit, pull a little of that out and replace it with a little bit of warm color here. Just, I think that little transition might be nice. That little transition right there. That's nice. So I soaked up some of that alizarin crimson and I replaced it with some of my warm color. So, you know, you can do this push-pull thing all the time you're working. Yeah, so I'm using, well, basically three colors because I've got my yellow that I put down first. That warms up all of my reds. And then um, I'm using the Rose Door for my highlights. I'm using the Permanent Alizarin Crimson for my shadows. And uh, so that's that's giving me lots of, uh, lots of depth and shape to this tulip. And I really don't need to do much of anything to to create more form here it's it's already being created as i'm painting the first washes <laughs> the longer the better i'm glad you like them long some some people are telling me you gotta make them shorter i can't sit for an hour and a half watching a video <laughs> i try i try to make them short i try to make people happy but sometimes it it just takes the time it takes because I'm a realistic painter so if I was painting quick and easy I could probably get it done in half an hour but not the style that I'm doing so and it's not everybody's cup of tea I can appreciate that what kind of a background would I do on this well we'll see oh gosh maybe we'll do a background next week we're already getting well into this uh, demo, but um, I probably would put an out of focus background on this. Maybe I'll continue this one next week, but I want to get the middle of the flower done. That should be dry enough, but it's going to take a minute to cool off. It's pretty hot. I've used quite a bit of heat here. There's my hand from my paper towel. <laughs> I think I'll get a new one just so I don't get such a dirty hand. This is why I can't have pretty things. 
<laughs> it's always such a mess. Yeah. So, all right. I'm just waiting for this to cool down a bit. And um, I want to be using some more of my um, gamboge color. I did put a light layer down, but I'm going to be using a little bit more. I'm also going to use a little bit of an, a cool yellow. So I'm going to use some areolin. Areolin, you can see it's a little bit more lemony. Let me show you on top or on the main screen here. You can see that there's a difference between these two yellows. This one's more cool. It's a cool yellow. This one's warmer, more like a gold kind of, kind of yellow. So while that's cooling off, I'm going to go change my water because gosh, look, look what I've got in my containers here. So, and I don't want it to drip on my painting. So let's uh, rinse this. So now I've got some clean water. Took my brushes with me to give them a bit of a rinse as well. Clean them out a little faster on with running water. It's a good thing I'm wearing red today because <laughs> I've got a lot of uh, I've got a lot of paint on my table and everything. Uh, should I wet again with a brush or mist? How to avoid overlaps? Ah, yes, I did say I would talk about that. So let's say, for example, I'm coming up to this line and I want to put um, maybe something similar next to it. So I'm coming up to this and I'm trying not to overlap and I'm doing okay, I'm doing okay, and then oops, I've got an overlap. So when that's dry, I'm going to show you what to do about that. It's like a double dark. That's what I call it, a double dark, because it overlaps and you get two layers, right? So, um, we'll see what that looks like when it's dry, but when you get two colors beside each other and, and they're both uh, you know, you get this sort of extra dark line in between, and it's not very nice in your painting, but it's an easier solution than you think. Um, okay, so this next layer, uh, I'm going to avoid. I'm going to avoid this center for a moment, and I'm going to ignore um, the the darks in here for the time being. I'm looking at the yellow, and the this. Uh, dark red here. So I'm going to paint around these shapes. I'm going to work carefully around these and I'm going to put in my nice um, warm yellow. So this uh, this is the uh, gamboge hue. Mine's a gamboge, actually they call it a mixture in Da Vinci. Gamboge mixture. And um, I'm going to paint nice Fill up my brush again. I'm going to paint this in around my first layer, which you'll see is is going to be obviously darker. I'm just painting around that center area. And once again, I'm, I'm making sure that I'm not spreading out my color because I want things to blend a little bit. And so I'm working around these things as carefully as I can with the tip of my brush. And I'm going to go up to about as far as that looks like it needs to go. Okay, 
I'm guessing, so I'm going to uh, just make a my best guess here at where that stops. And uh, this comes over here. And all of this is nice and wet, right? I'll show you once again the shine, and it looks pretty dark, right? Compared to that yellow that I have on there, but I haven't put my dark on yet. Everything's comparative. Uh, so I want to come into my alizarin crimson. And I don't want these to blend too much. So if I come in here, if I start here, it'll blend a lot. But if I start here and my paint starts to get a little drier as I come towards this, it won't blend that much. Let me show you what I mean. Oh, gosh, I've got a big, big glob on my brush. Don't want that. There. So, nice big puddle, well worked in. Make sure I don't have any residue from that. And I'm going to come in here to the middle, and this is going to be nice and rich. But I, I want to make sure that I'm touching my brush to a lot of this to keep a lot of this wet. That way I, I can slow down and I can work around all these things and not worry about the brush marks. Brush marks used to be my nemesis. I, I had them in everything I did, it seemed, and I didn't understand why I was getting brush marks. But I realized that once I was um, spreading out the paint too much, first of all, I was making my color too thin, but um, I was also um, not uh, keeping keeping my surface wet and I um, would come in and make blossoms and I would make brush marks all over the place and yeah, it just wasn't very good. So once I learned to work wetter, not try to control so much, it was a lot better for me. Now I still want to come in and probably do that overlap a little bit better, but for now this is working quite well. <coughs> Excuse me. Yep, it's springtime. <laughs> I am sneezing like crazy these days. And up on my tiptoe just to get down into this little tight area here. Working carefully around the shapes. But this edge, this edge right here, it's important that I keep that one kind of wet so that as I'm working, um, it doesn't start to dry. That's that's that leading edge that everybody talks about. And But now that I'm getting close to where I want to touch this and I don't want it to bleed, I want it a little bit soft, yes, but I don't want it to bleed. So this is where I can take this wet color and now I can spread a little bit here. So I'm going to blot my brush full of color and I can bring this up to this. I'm basically pulling the color from here right up to that yellow. And it's, it'll hit the yellow and it'll soften a little bit, but it won't bleed completely into my yellow. And I'll be able to get a little bit of a, a nice edge there that will look still soft. 
And why is this, why am I able to control that? It's because the yellow's been sitting there long enough that it's not wet anymore, it's only damp. So that means my brush is damp. Each, each of these colors is sort of equal consistency. It's, I haven't got one wetter than the other. It's wet up here, less wet down here. If that makes sense to you. There, so I've got a nice clean edge there. And, but my middle doesn't quite look right because my middle, um, like this area here, <laughs> needs to have the shadows and stuff. So I'm gonna lift a little bit of highlight out of this. So I see a little highlight right here. So I take my clean brush and wipe some of that color off. A little highlight there. Maybe a little highlight here. Bit over here perhaps. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to leave that to dry. I'll come back into that area when I want to put in some more darks, but I think I need to I think I need to darken some of that yellow. I'm going to dry this because what I what I do want to do at the moment is I want to lock in what I've got. <laughs> Thank you. Kind of feel like I could have probably put a little bit of warm up in there. I'm gonna I, I don't want to mess with it right now. I'll I'll dry it and maybe I can put some in at that point, but I, by drying it, I'm kind of setting what I've done. You know, it's not 100% set, but it's, you know, definitely not going to move around much if I'm careful. So my plan is here, I'm going to um, finish the middle of this up and we'll continue with this one um, with next week's uh, demo but like I'll do some background and stuff on it but let's finish the the tulip for today here we go it's pretty hot I need a I need a second fan or something to cool things down because I've really warmed things up all right so while that's cooling off, let's get back to this overlap. Okay, so this overlap was a question. I'm going to take a clean blotted brush. Let's get it a little cleaner than that. Clean blotted brush. Actually, even a synthetic brush is really good for this. And only damp. And, I, and a dry paper towel, so this part's dry. I'm going to use this. And I'm going to just tickle it and blot. Blot like frequently. Keep going in and blotting as you as you lightly dampen that excess color and it just lightens up or it moves that excess color and picks it up. If you blot quickly, you won't get into the layers that are sinking into the paper. You'll only get the ones that are sitting on top. So now that, that extra dark line there is gone. So it's a lot easier than you think. It's just a matter of doing that. And um, yeah, you can see here the difference between the two reds that I, I've chosen to use. I've chosen to use this one. This is the CAD red. It covers more. And um, yeah, so <laughs> all right, so I'm going to that's cool enough now. I'm going to do a little bit of the um, these darks in here. I want to show you something. If I were to take a little square with a hole in it and compare. Now my head says, that's yellow. That's yellow in there. 
No, it's not. It's orange. Look how different those are. That's actually an orange color, a dull orange. That's a bright orange. So that can't be right. I need to have something um, different in there. Now, in my photo, I don't know if it's quite that orange, but it is definitely darker. So I'm going to dampen the area. This time I'm dampening. I'm not I'm not soaking it the way, you know, I was with all that water before or all that paint before. Because if I if I only put a little bit of dampness on here, then my paint won't run too crazy and I'll be able to have a little bit more control. So I'm just re-wetting this yellow section. And I want to come in and put in a little bit more of a gold color in there. Now what can I use? Raw sienna is good, but I'm going to mix maybe. And uh, if I took my my uh, gamboge, and this is a good place to maybe use a little of that neutral tint. There, the, there's a little bit of that neutral tint. Bring it over here. So my camera will go nuts again. So if I take a little neutral tint and add it to this, I get a duller color. If I add too much, it's going to just kind of turn greenish and horrible. But uh, see, I've just made it a little bit darker and duller. Just a little bit of neutral tint in there. Hardly any. You've got to go very sparing with it. And, and I'm going to come into these areas. Now we'll see, we'll see how close I've come. My head says, oh, it's too dark, it's too dull. But I know that it's going to end up being uh, more correct if I dull it down a little bit. It almost looks greenish compared to all those warm tones, doesn't it? You notice I avoided the highlight area. There. So I'm just going to blend that edge there, just rinsed blotted brush, and I'm just going to blend this edge. Blend that edge a little bit. Okay, so let's do a comparison now. I shouldn't put this on wet, but um, give it a quick dry. And we'll compare the color because the color is better to compare when it's wet, when it's dry anyway. So we'll put that over there and we'll put it on here. Well, look at that. It's a lot closer. It still could be darker. Still could be darker. Let's, let's go in the same spot here. Yeah, still could be even a little bit darker, but I don't want my painting too dull, so I'm not going to go that dark. And I'm going to go just neutral tint now. Kind of dry brushing it on. So this is dry. And I'm looking, so I'm, I'm you can see on my paper towel how dry that is. And I'm going to do some streaks up through here. trying to go around that shape carefully. I could mask that off, but didn't want to go to that trouble. And I want it a little darker right here, I think. So pick up a little bit more of that neutral tint, just get it a little darker in there, but then Flick that out. And don't you love it when the darks go in? <laughs> just, that's my favorite part, you know, just getting those darks in there. It's like, 
there it is. There's, I've been waiting for that. You know, it's just been holding out on me. And there it is, finally, those darks. So there's a couple of little darks tucked in here and there. Some of them are a little bit more of this dark yellow color. So I'll just mix that up. And you can see how green this turns. I don't know if you can see that on my palette, but you'll see it in a second. When I paint this in here, it looks pretty green, which it does in the, pretty much does in the uh, photo too. Let's see, got to work around this. Now I'm working little shapes here. I could probably be switching to a smaller brush now. Whenever I fill in a shape like this, I don't want to just fill it in flat. I see transitions. So I see that it looks a little darker here. So I'm going to drop in some, some darker color right there. I'll put in some darker color here where I see it a little darker. It makes it so much more interesting, much more believable than doing just something flat. All right, so we have a couple of different things going on in this center here. We have um, this little, I guess that's the pistol. These are the stamen, maybe. Um, I, I, I'm guessing that that's what they're called. But uh, let me dry what I've got so that none of that dark will bleed into this. <clears throat> Getting those darks on is always so rewarding. I love that part. I'm going to switch to this smaller brush, maybe this synthetic. And this is where I'm going to use a little bit of that cool yellow. So this, this um, areolan yellow. Maybe don't even need it because I've already got such a pale version on here. Um, maybe I'll skip that. I don't, I don't really need that color. So don't need the areola, and I'm just going to use this uh, gamboge here. And I'm going to put the shading on this, this piece in the middle. In fact, I think I'll just wet the area first. I'm going to blot my brush and just dampen this section. Let me zoom in so you can see this a little closer. All right, so just using clean water here just to get this little section wet. And I'm coming in with, <coughs> pardon me, gamboge. And I'm looking, it's, it's darker on the bottom here. I actually see a little bit of red. I don't know if it's reflected red or whatever, but I see red and I think that that will be important to put in there. So a little touch of red. I'm going to use this warm red. Touch a little of that in. Once again, it's those nice transitions that make things really look nice. A little bit in the end here. And I need to help this blend a little bit, so I'm just going to rinse and blot my brush and just tickle that edge a little bit. Make sure that I don't have any hard lines forming. Some nice little hints of red in there. I like that. Okay, so I'm going to leave that. See a little spot I missed with my... Um, neutral tint, but I better dry this. Just this little tiny spot in here that needs to have a little bit of neutral tint. And sometimes a little spot like that can make a big difference. You know, it doesn't look very significant, but 
now I can see the shape of this much better. There's even a little bit hiding down in here. Little, little tiny bits. Now this is really small stuff that I'm doing here, but this is the detail. This is the center of the flower and definitely something that is um, going to require more attention because it is the focal point. All right, so fussing a little bit there. And the next part, these, these little parts here, those are much more pink, like definitely more pink. So I'm going to take that alizarin crimson. That's the, the warm red color. Yes, Janet, I think you're right. This, this red is the reflective from the petals. But um, the camera's doing something funny too. So um, the, um, the alizarin crimson permanent alizarin crimson. If I thin that down, I get a really nice pink. So even though we used pink as a shadow before, if I thin it and kind of dry brush it on, didn't dry brush it quite well enough, but if I dry brush that on, I can get this really pinky uh, type of uh, stamen here. Is much 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 thinner than what I used up here. Tremendously thinner. And I'll probably have to hit this a couple of times just so that I can get some shape to these. Come in here, get a little bit more a little bit more of that alizarin crimson. So play a little bit with the, um, you know, how much water or how much paint you're using. Um, and, and look at every little, like it's a little tiny, tiny shape. And it will, um, it will probably transition. Like this one's got to be a lot lighter at the tip than it is down here. So I need to make sure that I put this nice cool red down into here. So this permanent alizarin crimson is a cool. So I'm putting in a couple of these little stripey things, like little just striations or something. And then we've got this little fold over thing going on here. So We've got, got a change in direction there, and this one too, it's got a fold over, so it's darker underneath that fold over. And uh, that's probably all I need to do for this. And uh, I think we'll just uh, wrap this one up, but let me just make sure I haven't missed any questions. Um, Alizarin crimson is a, indeed a cool, cool red. A warm red looks like um, a little more orange. So, oh, okay, pistol and stamen. Yeah, okay, good to know. Um, yeah, I don't. Let me just scroll back, make sure I haven't missed any questions. Uh, perylene violet is really good for darkening yellows. Okay, that's good to know. Perylene uh, KKD Aquarelle says, uh, I find perylene violet is uh, really cool, really good for darkening yellows. And yes, the reason that that works is because purple is a complement to yellow, so it will neutralize and dull that down. Um, Okay, D says, I want more shadows in my blurry background. How best to go back in and not lose the softness? Okay, we're going to cover the background next week. So 
Um, so I won't get into that. I mean, we're already well into today, so and I have another class starting soon, so I'm going to have to wrap it up. This was a fairly long one that I, I had said I was going to try and make it quick at the beginning, but <laughs> the usual. Um, on what and what out of focus background? I mean, okay. Still questions on background, so I, you know, I'll, I'll answer those next week when we do the background. I do get a lot of questions about my blurry backgrounds, especially on my florals. But, uh, but I have this nice warm, warm color here. I've got, I like the, the, um, that yellow that's glowing through this this flower. And, you know, I, as I said, I could probably come in and, and redo some of these, build them up a little bit more. They're a little bit on the flat side, you know. This this petal looks all of a sudden very flat. I could come in and uh, pull up a little bit of this uh, permanent alizarin crimson and replace it with some of that... Um, rose door if I wanted to put in some warm there because I've got a lot of pigment on here so if I come in and lift up some of that I could put a little bit of glowing rose door in there which is what I wanted to do there we go put a little bit of that in there now that glows more right and just make sure that I don't get a hard line somewhere. So I'm just dampening this. There we go. So now I've got a little bit of glow in there. So I, I pulled out some of that excess color and I replaced it. So that's something you can do. I can re reapply anywhere I want to, all of that kind of stuff. So let's wrap this up for, for good now. <laughs> And uh, we'll see you next week, and uh, we'll work on that background. Thanks very much. See you next week. Have a great week, and enjoy your long weekend if you're in Canada. Bye.